This lesson will teach us more about how to find limits. We will learn how to find limits using what's called substitution. Another method is factoring. And then a third method would be using a table. To begin, let's start by reviewing what we learned in limits number one, which was how to evaluate a limit given a graph. So in this question, I'm given the graph of y equals x squared. Notice how the notation for these limit questions is a little bit different. Instead of having f of x here, I have the actual function expression written right there, and that's just an alternate way of um, expressing a limit. In question number one, I'm asked to find the limit of x squared as x approaches 2. So remember, a limit doesn't care about what happens at 2. Just as I get closer and closer, I can see as I get closer to 2 from either side, I hit a value of 4. So this is a 4. Question 2 is asking uh, the limit of x squared as x approaches 1. So I will move this over to 1. And again, as I approach from the left or from the right, I can see I'm heading for that y value of 1. So my answer here is 1. Question 3 is a little bit different. I'm going to be approaching 1 half. And I get into an approximation here because I don't know exactly where 1 half is. Uh, and as I approach from either side, I'm just kind of making a guess right here. But there's actually a better way of doing this one because of the nature of this graph, because you can draw it with one continuous fluid motion. All I really have to do is take this value that I'm approaching and substitute it in. So the answer to question number three is simply one fourth. This method is called direct substitution. And even though it seems super simple, it is totally a valid way of evaluating a limit. And you can always want to make it the first thing you always try. On question four, I have the limit as x approaches 2 of the absolute value of x minus 1 minus 3. And all I'm going to do is take the 2, and I'm just going to substitute it in. And here it is substituted in, and then I just calculate from there. I get a final answer of negative 2. One thing to note, because proper notation is very important, one thing to note is when I substitute the 2 in, notice that I don't write the limit as x approaches 2 anymore. On question number 5, I do the same thing. I'm just going to take the pi, and I'm going to substitute that in. And this becomes cosine of pi, which is negative 1. When I get down to question number six, now I have a piecewise function, and we have to handle these a little bit differently. When you have a piecewise function, because they're not necessarily continuous, we need to check out the right and the left-hand limits on this one. When I do the left and the right-hand limits, notice my notation. So I've got the limit as x is approaching 1 from the left. So I have to look at this piecewise function, and I have to pick the appropriate function that's on the left side of 1. So x is less than 1 is on the left side, so that's why I chose x squared minus 2 for the left-hand limit. When I go to evaluate the limit, all I have to do is take the 1 and simply plug it in. The little negative right here, that just tells me which of these two functions I'm going to pick. But once I've made that choice, all I do is substitute this 1 into the function. I do a direct substitution, and I get negative 1 as my answer. And I do the same thing for the right-hand limit right here. Limit as x approaches 1 from the right. That is this function right here is on the right side of 1, so that's the function that I choose. And once I do that, I just ignore this. The purpose of the negative and the plus is to tell me which of these functions I'm going to choose for the left and the right-hand limits. And once I've made that choice, now I just substitute the 1 in, and I get negative 1 here as well. And because these are the same from the left and from the right, this general limit that I'm asked to find is that same answer. Go ahead and pause the video and see if you can do number 7 and number 8. Here are my two one-sided limits. Here I'm evaluating the limit as x approaches 2 from the left. And my answer here ends up being 3. My right-hand limit, evaluating 2 from the right, my answer here ends up being 2. 
the fact that these are not equal means that the general limit does not exist. On question number eight, when I try my direct substitution, I get four minus 12 plus eight over two minus two, and I get zero over zero. This is called indeterminate form, and it's something that's gonna show up for us indeterminate form, that zero over zero, and it becomes a problem in which we need to solve. So keep in mind, zero over zero is not an answer. It means exactly what it sounds like. It does not determine the answer. So we have to find different methods um, to solve questions like this, and that brings us to our next method, which is called factoring. So after I've done my direct substitution and I get the dreaded zero over zero, I need to look for something else. So I'm going to factor number nine. If you recall what you learned about graphs in algebra two, when I have a common factor like this x minus two, what that means is my graph actually has a hole at x equals two. So the graph of this rational function it's just gonna look like the graph of x minus four, but it's gonna have a hole at this x equals two. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cross these out and I'm canceling out the hole. And once I do that, I can retry my substitution. So now I'm gonna substitute the two in and I get two minus four and I get an answer of negative two. So my answer is negative two. If you think about what you're doing algebraically, it just kind of makes perfect sense. Because when I'm crossing out these common factors, I am eliminating the thing that is causing the zero over zero to happen. Because when I plug in a two and I do two minus two, that's generating a zero here, which makes that whole numerator zero and ditto for the denominator. So by crossing that out, I am getting rid of the thing that is making the zero over zero happen, and then I do my substitution from there. I also want you to pay attention to the notation that I use. Notice that when I rewrote this step, this factoring step, the limit as x approaches two was still there. You do not drop this limit notation until you actually do your substitution. So notice when I hit this next step is when I did not write the limit as x approaches two any longer. Go ahead and try number 10 and number 11, and I've given you a hint on number 11 that there is a factoring the difference of two perfect cubes. If you forgot what the formula is, I've got it down here. So give those a go, and then we'll talk, talk about, them. about them. So here's number 10 factored. In the numerator, I factored out the x cubed, and once I do that, I can cancel it out with the x cubed in the denominator. And notice what happened when I did that. When I crossed out the x cubed, I am eliminating what was causing the zero over zero to happen. And once I've done that, now I can take my zero and I can just do a direct substitution into what's left. And that gives me an answer of five over four. On question number 11, I first have to factor that numerator using the difference of two perfect cubes which I have the formula listed right here for you. And once I get this factored, I can see that x minus two common factor, I can cancel out, eliminates my problem of causing that zero over zero. And now I can just take my two and I can substitute it into what's left. And that's gonna give me two squared plus two times two plus four, and my final answer here is 12. The last method we're gonna look at today is how to use a table of values to evaluate a limit. So I'm given this limit here, and if I do a direct substitution and I plug in the x equals three, we can see in this table that's gonna give us the zero over zero so this generates that zero over zero. But that is the only off limits value. I can pick something closer and closer and closer to three and I can plug it into my function and I can actually get a value. And I could do that with numbers 
less than three, and I can do that from the right side of three. So we're kind of doing the same thing we were doing in a graph when we were approaching from the left side and getting really, really, really close and approaching from the right side and getting really, really, really close. We're just doing that with actual numbers. And you can look at the trend of the numbers as they've been plugged into this function, and you can see that they're getting progressively closer to 1.5 from the left and from the right as I go from a 1.4918 to this number, to this number, I'm getting closer and closer to a 1.5. So I can look at the trend of the numbers in this table from both sides, and I can say that this limit will equal 1.5. I would like for you to go ahead and pause the video and just do one more practice problem. It's the same one. We know the answer is a 1.5, but do this problem by factoring just to give you a little bit of practice. So I factor the numerator into x plus 6, x minus 3. The denominator is a difference of two squares, so x plus 3, x minus 3 are the factors. And I spot this common factor of x minus 3 that I can cancel out. And once I do that, I've eliminated what was causing my 0 over 0 to happen. And so now I can just take my 3 and I can plug it in. And I can get my final answer of 9 over 6, which simplified is a 3 over 2, or that 1.5 that we got from the table. Just one thing to note on this one. Um, and I've said it before, but it's kind of an important point. Make sure as you're doing this problem, you try your direct substitution first. Sometimes that will give you the answer. If you get 0 over 0, then try factoring. Make sure you're careful with your notation. So as I go through, notice here I haven't plugged the 3 in, so the limit as x approaches 3 appears in both of these statements here. And the first time that I drop the limit as x approaches 3 is when I'm actually substituting the 3 into the function. Your ability to do well with these types of problems is based on your ability to factor. So if you're a little rusty at it or if you need more practice problems, uh, just let us know and we'd be happy to provide it.